Hey, my dark darlings. Uh, before we get into today's episode, I wanted to tell you about one of our sponsors without whom we wouldn't be able to do the show every week. So of course, I'm talking about Best Fiends, that super casual and cute mobile puzzle game. You know, the one with all the cute little bugs and slugs in it. So I always have my phone on me. So whenever I want to take a quick break from researching horror titles and movies, I can enjoy some puzzles with my Best Fiends. Plus, um, I do a lot of traveling lately. So because there's no internet connection needed, Best Fiends has become one of my go-to pleasures whenever I'm flying. It's visually fun, and I like that it also stays fresh. Best Fiends updates the game monthly, so with my attention span, that's great, because then you have those new levels plus events. So engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Arkea, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. Things that go bump in the night. You know, every house and apartment and wherever you live has settling noises. Right now, I have a light switch that does a particular buzzing sound. Not all the time, just sometimes at night. It's enough to drive me a little bit insane but not enough for me to do something about it, if that makes sense. So that's the topic of what we're covering tonight. When sirens splinter the night, do you go towards the noise and do something? Or do you take it as a sign to ignore, to run away? Some run away, some towards, because sounds can be warnings of dangers near them, Or maybe those dangers are waiting for you to flee towards where it really waits, which is around the next corner, closer than you might ever think. First, buzz is that there is a new girl at school. Next, that sound you hear is a catchy jingle beckoning to be heard. After that, we hear skittering, scratching away in the night. And finally, The cries of children call for you in a park late at night. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. As always, the first story you hear is one that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. Then, I read a few more stories for the podcast. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. And if you'd like to support the show and receive bonus content, Consider joining our Patreon. Our patrons play a huge role in keeping the show running every single week. For more information on how you can help the show and also be a part of it, visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Whispers that bite. At schools, there is a sound that never quite goes away. It can linger everywhere you turn haunting the halls, and even following you home. For years, a towering schoolhouse had ushered new students like Chris into its dimly lit brick halls. No matter where Chris went in the sprawling school, a classroom, the cafeteria, even the library, Chris heard chattering and whispers about her. Hushed gossip taunted and sniped at her from around every corner. Every mean word buzzed in her ears and repeated over and over in her head. This went on for weeks until one day, Mrs. Abate, the school counselor, called Chris into her office. You seem to be having trouble with your transition to our school, Mrs. Abate pointed out. As she listened, Chris noticed the counselor tugging at her high collar blouse that almost hid a series of small pitted scars along her neck. I'm not very well liked here, Chris admitted. Everyone is always talking about me, whispering behind my back. As hard as it is, don't listen. Our school is a very special place, Mrs. Abate replied, but you are more than what people say you are. Block the whispers out, don't let them get under your skin. That night, 
Chris sat at home, scrolling through her phone. A post by a classmate, Ryan, caught her eye. It was about Chris, referring to her as a poor, know-it-all, ugly monster, saying Chris didn't belong at their school. Poor, know-it-all, ugly monster. For a stunned moment, Chris said in the shame of those words. They hissed and lingered with her, just like the whispers she heard in school. Chris kept scrolling. Other students had commented, adding their own nasty words to the thread. The chorus of cruel buzzing grew with every new comment. Were they right? Was she somehow gross? A monster? Ow! Something bit the tip of Chris's thumb. She watched as an angry red welt swelled and rose. The heck was that? Chris looked around frantically for a bug. All at once, Chris felt sharp pricks along her arms. Something was biting her over and over. The buzzing roared. Chris clawed at the bumps appearing along her hands, on the back of her arms, desperate to stop the itch. Was it spiders, bed bugs? She couldn't find what they were, or where they were coming from. Chris could only feel them pinching, burring beneath her skin, spreading, misshaping her arms with grotesque red peaks. Chris scratched. Her scratching turned frenzied, skin tearing and bleeding beneath the tug of her nails. Catching sight of herself in the mirror, Chris stared at herself in horror. I am a monster. She spun away from her deformed reflection, believing every horrible thing they had said. On her phone, the comments kept coming. The whispers buzzed on. The next day at school, Chris showed up in long sleeves. She'd woken up with her arms and legs covered in oozing sores. A few had even spread to her neck. Ashamed, Chris slumped to her desk. Around her, classmates shot glances her way, turning to one another to whisper. A giggle caught Chris's attention. Ryan, mouth scowling in disgust, was gesturing to Chris's rash-riddled neck. Chris tugged her shirt up, trying to hide her sores from view. She thought of Mrs. Abate's own high collar and remembered her words. Chris had let the whispers upset her, she realized. This school was a special place indeed. But I am more than what people say about me, she reminded herself. Across the room, Ryan giggled again. The hum of the whispers grew. Chris's shoulders straightened. She stood up. Speak up, she demanded over the growing buzz permeating the air. Ryan stopped giggling. Excuse me? Speak up, Chris planted herself firmly. If you were saying something kind, you wouldn't need to whisper. For a moment, the buzzing faltered. Why do you need to hide your face behind a computer screen? The class, ooh, looking at the two. Ryan paled as gossip started buzzing around her. Suddenly crying out, something bit her mouth. A red bump growing on her face, then another, spreading, the buzz growing stronger this time. Then all around Ryan, classmates turned to one another, exchanging whispers all about Ryan. Within the mania of the gossip, it didn't stop there. They also turned on one another, tearing into each other with words. And Chris could see what was happening to them, could see them scratching at bumps like hers. They began to peel and pop on their skin. They growled and snapped at each other, getting nastier and spitting insults like daggers. The buzzing swelled to a deafening cacophony. Ryan turned her eyes back on Chris. You, you're doing this. You're infecting us. No, Chris commanded over the clamor. We've infected ourselves. The whispers don't care. They'll attack any of us. I'm not a monster and neither are you. No one here is. The buzzing dipped, softer now. We can't keep allowing other people's words to make us one. The last vengeful buzz died. Though the whispers had died down for now, everyone noticed that a few pitted scars remained on their skin. They each had been marked by each other's words of cruelty and would carry those marks for years to come. They were a reminder that the whispers would always be there and that whispers can bite. In life, friends drift apart, but what we experience together will stand the test of time, even things that should stay hidden in memory, like in this story inspired by Jojo. After the school bell rang, Jojo, Pete, and Nate grabbed their gear to head to basketball practice. As they made their way through the empty halls of West Oakland Middle, they began to hear a strange warped sound trailing their steps. 
Anyone's phone going off? Pete asked. Jojo checked his cell. Not mine. Nate echoed him. Wasn't there phones making these strange sounds? Past the rows of lockers ahead of them, they heard a jostling and froze. There, there was a crouched figure hulking up toward them. Overhead, the lights in the hallway flickered as it got closer, and a low screech filled the air. The figure lumbered closer and closer. The thin screech became clearer as the figure stepped fully into view. It was just the janitor, pushing a squeaking trash can on wheels away. Wow, guys, Nate laughed trying to sound as if he wasn't about to wet himself. Their relief was cut short, however, because the off-putting warping sound returned again, almost rhythmically, like a voice trying to be heard, muffled and beckoning. There it is. Jojo pointed it out. Wait, is that singing? Basketball practice temporarily forgotten, they all stopped in their tracks when they heard a soft, creepy chant. Down by the bay where the watermelons rot, run fast, get home, just don't get caught. An iPod in a locker, maybe. Let's go. Pete pushed Jojo ahead of him as the warping sound intensified, the voice surrounding them with a catchy, rhythmic chant. But if you do, my mother will say, don't look out the window down by the bay. The last words were breathed behind them and they turned. Before them stood a dark, towering, clawfoot, slick-skinned creature, three shiny black eyes protruding on its head, eyeing each of them. It opened its great maw and smiled. <laughs> Screaming, they ran. The creature hunted them, still singing. The warping and chanting encompassed their world, tunneling into their ears, beating along with their rapidly beating hearts. Down by the bay where the watermelons rot, Nate screamed as he clipped a locker and fell sprawling out into the hallway. Run fast, get home, just don't get caught. Jojo snatched the back of Nate's shirt and dragged him up as he felt something grab the back of his. But if you do, my mother will say. It was Pete, yelling into both of their ears, pushing them forward and everywhere. The hunting chant is like fish hooks in their ears, tearing into their souls. Don't look out the window, down by the... Bursting into the gym, they knocked over confused teammates, pointing behind them to the suddenly quiet and empty hallway. They tried to explain the creature they saw, but everyone laughed at them. Embarrassed, they tried to shake off what happened, like they had just been joking. There was no way that they could have seen what they thought they saw. Choosing to remain silent about the creature, they found less and less to be able to say to each other. And these close friends, eventually, that shared secret drove them apart. Years later, when Jojo was packing for college, he found a picture of his old friends, Nate and Pete. We used to be so tight, he thought, but they'd grown up apart somehow and he tried to remember why. They looked happy in the picture. They were all carrying the team's basketball trophy. As he stared at their smiling faces, something pinged in his head. Wait, we were running. Running from that thing. He breathed in as the warping sound echoed in his memory. The past came flooding back. Suddenly, he began to recall those catchy, catchy words. Down by the bay where the watermelons rot. The words seemed to grow and fill in his room, his ears, his mind. Run fast, get home. Unable to stop, Jojo felt a tug in his mind, similar to what a fish would feel on a hook. Just don't get. Outside his window, the creature continued. 
As someone that continuously has songs stuck in my head, this particular story terrifies me. If I was hunted by something that used songs to catch you, and then if it didn't catch you physically then, but it did catch you when you remembered the song later, well, I'd have no hope at all. Do you wonder if the creature also visited Nate and Pete? Do you have any kind of creepy experience like this that maybe you've experienced with friends? Maybe not like this, but a shared experience that you want to share? Please let me know if you do. Email us something scary at snarl.com. Maybe we'll turn it into our next story. When we fall asleep, our minds wander into dreamland and our bodies still lay there in the bed. So what sort of things could prey on our bodies as vessels once our brain and voices are away? Like in this story, submitted by Alexis. Eleanor was awakened in the middle of the night by the sound of her little sister, Lee, meowing at the window. Quit it, she said. But Lee ignored her and just stared out into the night at the full moon. Tossing a pillow toward her, a strange glaze cast over Lee's eyes, and she turned and hissed at her. Lee, stop being weird. Eleanor sighed, but there was no response. Maybe she's sleepwalking, Eleanor thought. So she tried to get close to wake her. Suddenly, overcome by an almost unnaturally fast reflex, Lee swiped at her, and Eleanor blocked the attack with her arm. Ow! she said as something in Lee's hand hit the floor. It was a tiger figurine, broken from the fall. What happened? Lee asked, rubbing her eyes, wondering how she was out of bed. Eleanor, your arm! There were two long red scratches bigger than Lee's fingernails on her arm. They looked like they were made by the claws of a larger creature. Uh, It's okay. You were only sleepwalking. Time for sleep. After putting her sister back in bed with little resistance and lots of apologies, Eleanor inspected the broken toy. Going to put the broken tiger figurine on Lee's bedside, that's when she noticed a strange box on it. It was a menagerie filled with ceramic figurines of zoo animals. The next morning, Lee told her she had found the box in the attic. It must have been their grandmother's, their mother speculated. Later, she pulled Eleanor aside and asked her to watch out for her sister if this sleepwalking persisted. The following night, Lee picked another figurine to play with. Oh, gross! Put that away! Eleanor shook her head when she saw the spider figurine in the palm of her sister's hand. It's just a friendly spider. Lee yawned as she continued to play. Go to sleep, Lee. As Eleanor drifted off to sleep, the nightlight cast Lee's shadow on the wall as she played with the spider. Dreaming, or so Eleanor thought, she began to watch as the spider grew and came to life, scaling the wall and disappearing. Startled awake, Eleanor turned and saw that her sister was gone out of the room. Lee? She asked out into the darkness of the hallway. No response. Quit it. Get back in here. It's time for bed. Eleanor walked back toward the door and a pitter-patter grew. She turned on the hallway light, but there was no one there. Then she felt something wet drop on her face. Another trail of sticky liquid fell on her forehead and she looked up to see Lee with spider claws protruding from her side, the scratching sounds of her skittering on the wall stopping as she stopped and stared. With a thud, she pounced on Eleanor. Screaming, she tried to fight Lee off as the spider figurine rested between Lee's lips, twisting its body and her mouth. Their mother ran into the room. She pulled Lee back off of Eleanor, not processing the surreal danger until she saw more eyes pop out 
on Lee's face. Two pincers began tearing through her daughter's mouth. Lee began to choke. It's the figurine, Eleanor shouted, and their mother put her arm around her daughter's stomach and used the Heimlich maneuver over and over and finally dislodging it. With a cough, the spider figurine flew out of Lee's mouth. After resting on the floor for a moment, it righted itself, quickly skittering back towards Lee. Grabbing the box, Eleanor slammed it on top of the spider, shattering it on the spot. Continuing her rampage, she, Lee, and their mother smashed each and every zoo animal in the box. There would be no more possession. She'd freed her sister from the grasp of the haunted sleep relics. None of them noticed, however, what had been thrown from the box during Eleanor's first swing of it. A final sleep relic, different than the rest. As it stealthily crawled safely under the bed, the big top clown figurine smiled as it thought of the nights to come. Thank you, Alexis, for sharing this story with us. I would think by this point, all of us would know not to play with a box of old toys if we found them. But it's always different in the real world than how you hear in stories. And I will say this when it comes to sleepwalking and night terrors, just let them sleep. Leave them alone. I don't think we'd like the outcome if they woke up during that night terror. It's scientifically proven that there are certain sounds that few humans can ignore, but would they be easier to ignore if you're by yourself late at night? Let's find out, and this story inspired by a Reddit submission from that's underscore specific. My hand was on the handle on my way out from pulling a double shift when my manager called me back over. Ira, he shouted, don't forget your book bag. Grabbing my canvas satchel, I thanked my boss and sprinted out the door as fast as I could, knowing I was about to miss the last shuttle to the campus dorms. A cloud of exhaust smoke hit my face. It was too late, and the shuttle made a turn. No use in running after it. I'd tried that before. I had to walk through the city park to the subway. I didn't like doing that at night. With trepidation, I stepped onto the bridge over the pond and... That's when I heard a strange noise. It sounded like cooing and whining. Like a very small child. Maybe a baby? Hello? I asked into the darkness. The trees swayed. It was a chilly night. No reason a kid should be out this late. What if they were lost? Under the streetlights, I could see rustling and hear the distinct sound of running and more cries. Stepping off the path, I moved past some brush to search for where the child could have been. Do you need help? But I couldn't see anyone. I reached for my phone and texted my boss. I think there's a kid in the park. I can't find them, but I hear them crying. Can you help me? It was so strange. Is anyone out there? Where were the parents? Then the cries began to sound. They sounded closer. I looked over towards the yellow lights that lined the path. There was nothing out of the ordinary, yet still, unease tugged at me. Glancing around at the ground for footprints and at the vacant benches, I found that there were only empty spaces, no one else to help. So I headed away from the light and into the darkness of the park. It won't be that hard to find a child. But also, I realize, why would a child approach a grown man looking for them? That's weird. Maybe I should go back. I'd probably be scaring them away further into the woods to hide. Shaking my head, I cried out, Hey, I'm going to call for help. Don't be scared. I'll find you. I have three younger sisters, and each of them would kill me if I left you out here alone. Taking my phone back out, I dialed 911 as I moved further and further into the dark, into the wilderness, pushing branches and trees out of my way, searching for this child. 911, what's your emergency? The operator asked. Hi, I'm walking through River Pine Park. 
I've been hearing a child crying and I can't find them or their guardians. I looked back at where I stood and realized I had gone much deeper into the park. It couldn't really even be called a park at this point. It was very woodsy and dark. Sir, I need for you to stop your search and leave the park immediately. I'm sending squad cars out now. You're in danger. Meanwhile, the crying in the background ceased. A chill came over me. What? The trees around me pushed in. I couldn't tell where in the woods I was now or how to get back. Blindly, I rushed ahead. There was no street light in sight. Get back to a well-lit area now, the operator commanded. Stay on the line. My foot kicked something on the ground and the crying started again, right in front of me. Looking down, I realized I had hit a tape recorder. Incredulous, I bent down to grab it, just when a black bag covered my head. There's a manhunt for a suspect at large. Six people whose last known location was near River Pine Park have all gone missing. Ira Monsoor, age 21, a student at River Pine College and an employee at Martino's Italian Kitchen, is just the latest victim in this string of disappearances. Piecing together a 911 call and text message received by a manager at Martino's, Ira Monsoor describes similar sounds previously reported. It appears that all of them had been lured into the park by the sounds of crying children. This week's podcast stories were edited by Linnea Bond, Marquia McCarty, and Sabina Graves. Audio edited by Johnny Ashley and Calvin Linderman. Produced by Annalise Nelson. Music by Sapphire Sandalo. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams.